All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Team here. And this is BXJS Weekly, episode 108. Bringing you all the best JavaScript news of the week in a podcast form. And we do have quite a bit of really cool stuff today. Uh, before we get started, I just want to say that I am now trying to restream to Mixer as well. I've heard from some people that it works better in, well, some countries basically than others, you know. So you now have a choice between the YouTube twitch and mixer so pick the platform that works better for you and just watch there uh, as usual the vod will be on all of those i think mixer has them so uh there you go anyway let us uh start uh, let us get started is what i want to start God, what is wrong with me okay <laughs> let's get started first section as usual is getting started we got four articles here today starting with the first one called progressive rendering the key to faster web this is a pretty good explanation of uh, what progressive rendering is, what is the difference between client-side rendering, server-side rendering, and progressive rendering, and how do they actually benefit you. Uh, hey, Andril, welcome to the stream. Okay, so if you are you know, just getting started with the web and you were confused as to what the uh, client-side, server-side, and progressive rendering are, and what's the differences, and when should you use which one, and how does it help you, this article is for you. If you already know those and, you know, like at least know the basics, you won't really find anything um, more advanced here. Let's just put it this way. It is, again, just a like conceptual overview. There is no technical details in here. There's no examples of implementation. Well, maybe one basic code here, but uh, that's about it. But it's a really good explanation of the differences of those. Okay, next article we got here is React Router and Nginx over HTTP2. A practical tutorial on how to set up Nginx with HTTP2 and serve your React app with React Router and make, you know, the whole like routing and navigation work, which uh, can be quite a bit challenging at first, especially when you are not familiar with Nginx and how to configure it properly. So if you are curious about that, it also uses Docker. Uh, do check the article out. It does a pretty good job of explaining how to set everything up, how to do a basic performance improvements, how to set up the SSL and stuff like this. So if you are just getting started with Nginx, I guess, and React apps, this is a pretty good starting point. Or if you wanted to learn how to enable HTTP2, this will also help you quite a bit. All right, uh, next article we got here is building a code editor with code mirror. This is a pretty nice code mirror tutorial, essentially. So if you ever wanted to embed a code editor into your app, then uh, this is a really good starting point with, uh, you know, code highlighting and basic lib integration and stuff like this. So if you are curious, do check this one out. And the last article in getting started section we have is Telegram bot for GitHub Actions. This is a pretty basic tutorial on writing a Telegram bot that will essentially um, do something from your GitHub action whenever you run it. Uh, could be useful for notifications and stuff like this. Uh, I, again, you know, if you're using Telegram, that might be helpful. I honestly don't know if the bots like this are helpful, at least for me. But uh, maybe it is for you, so do check this one out. Maybe this is exactly what you were looking for. Hey, Matrix, I am feeling a lot better. Thank you very much. Uh, and yes, uh, welcome to the stream. Okay, uh, continuing, we got articles and news section. We got four articles here today. The first one being a practical guide to memory leaks in Node.js. It's a pretty good write-up that uh, outlines how to track down and catch the uh, memory leaks in Node.js using the tools that you have, basically. Uh, again, you know, I don't think that memory leaks is super large problem. Like in about 99% of cases, the garbage collector does a really good job of uh, figuring out what exactly do you need to collect. But there are some cases that can produce leaky abstractions that can basically leak objects into memory that are never disposed because there are some references retained to that. And in these cases, you want to have to know basically how exactly do you um, track that down? How do you figure out what is leaking? What are objects that are node disposed? Where do you find them? And so on and so forth. So if you are, uh, I guess, new to Node.js and memory uh, management, then do check this one out. It's actually a pretty good guide. Hey, Leonid, welcome to the stream. 
Okay, continuing, we got pointer compression in V8. So this one is, uh, yeah, that's not an easy article to read. Let me just put it this way. It's a write-up from the V8 team on pointer compression. So pointer compression is this new technique that was introduced um, in Chrome while well, after they switched from, uh, so, okay. So in 2014, Chrome still used 32-bit process. And, and then at some point they switched to 64-bit, right? which means that all the pointers that uh, were in the memory are now 64 bits pointers and they are taking twice as much space, right? Um, which means that, well, the usage of the memory increased up to 60% in some, um, some cases with an average of 40%, which is a lot, right? And it's just for switching architecture. So the pointer compression is a technique that uh, reduces, aims to reduce the memory consumption by uh, simplifying the way or changing the way that the pointers are stored. The idea is really simple. Instead of storing the whole 64-bit pointers, you just store a 30-bit, like you just store 30-bit offset from some base address. So you have like one base address and then say, okay, so this is on offset one, this is on offset two and so on and so forth. Now, this is the gist of it, but the article itself goes into a lot of details of how exactly that works. And those details are insane. Like the, the way it's written is, is really fun to read and very, very entertaining uh, on a um, technical level, let's put it this way. Um, so it goes uh, in like a lot of depth, including some, you know, assembly here and there and explanations of what exactly happens in different parts of v8 such as you know turbofan and octane and so on and so forth uh and if you're curious about the details just read it if you are curious about internals of v8 i would highly recommend reading this is really cool now i'll just you know i won't go through all of that i just want to show you the results of applying this technique it actually reduced the uh, v8 heap memory down to 40 percent in well 35 40 percent in most of the cases which is just insane like look at that the improvements the v8 team brings to the well you know the engine is just every time is mind-blowing how do they even come up with this stuff and not just the memory improvements are there but the um the this technique allows the websites to utilize less cpu and uh, garbage collector time um, not you know as as impressive as the memory consumption, like 40%, right? but still, you know, going from a couple percent on something like Reddit, going down to like 10% on something as heavy as Facebook, for example, which is pretty damn impressive, to be honest. So if you are curious about more details, I would encourage you to read a, like through the whole article. It is lengthy, but nonetheless, as I said, you know, very entertaining and very interesting and uh, very educational. So there we go. Okay. Next thing we got here is how an anti-ad blocker works. Reverse engineering block ad block. Uh, it's probably one of my favorite ones this week. So this is a deep dive into the block ad block thing that, uh, well, blocks the ad block and says, hey, uh, you're actually using ad block, disable it to view the content. And uh, this is step-by-step -step reverse engineering of how it works and also showing how do you reverse engineer something, which is in my opinion, really cool. Uh, hey, Fredo, welcome to the stream. Okay, so um, the, yeah, as it says, you know, the is basically step-by-step -step reverse engineering. It starts from the unpacking the code, figuring out the initial scripts and uh, so on and so forth, which is really cool. So it's like, uh, it's literally walks you through the script step-by-step -step and explains what exactly it does version by version as well. So it's like looks at the improvements, the changes they uh, made to the script to figure out if the ad blocking works or not. So this unending uh, battle between uh, ad block blocker and ad blockers, <laughs> which is bonkers, but it's really cool to read, you know, about the techniques that people basically come up uh, to figure out if you're running ad block or not. And then the ad blockers figuring out how do you check for that and how do you actually block that effectively. It is really fascinating. So if you are curious about the ad blocking scene and how exactly do they uh, catch that, there is six versions that are here and that are try to block various techniques and approaches. Uh, the latest one being like, you know, blocking Brave, which has become quite widespread to be honest. And uh, it's, it's a nice browser for people who don't want to fiddle too much with the configs. 
So there you go. If you are curious uh, about reverse engineering stuff and specifically about how block ad block works, then do have a read through. It's a really great article and it's really cool uh, to have a look at all of this code and all of these approaches to catching ad blocks. Uh, so there we go. Okay, and the last article we got here for today is understanding ECMAScript spec part three. This is the third part uh, in uh, understanding the ECMAScript spec articles where he talked about the previous ones. And this one basically continues uh, with the same vein. So this is a deep dive into the syntax and it goes into the syntax grammar and shows how exactly the spec describes the, well, you know, the really basic JavaScript code that you would write like this in a standardized way, essentially, which can be quite challenging to read, let's be honest. So I'm not going to go in depth here. Um, again, you know, this is an amazing article. It's, it's a really well written and makes it a lot easier to understand ECMAScript spec if you never had to read specs before. So if you are interested in reading spec, if you are interested in learning how to read it, I would highly recommend reading this one. And if you haven't seen the previous parts, them as well, because all three are amazing. All right. That is it for the articles in news. Now we have tips, tricks, and bit-sized awesomeness. We do have quite a bit here. Uh, a lot of them are related to the uh, ECMAScript committee meeting that happened a few days ago, I think. Uh, but anyway, let's get from uh, started from the first one. So the first one here is announcement from uh, people from the Node team. So Node 14 is due to be released on April 21st, which is uh, relatively soon, just a couple of weeks. And there is already a release candidate one uh, that you can just download and try. So if you are curious to see what will be in node 14, uh, well, then there is RC1 available for all platforms. Just go ahead, grab it and give it a shot. Uh, it's pretty neat. So I honestly cannot wait for that. Uh, it's probably gonna be quite good because it's probably I think it's gonna have the latest V8, which means we're gonna get optional chaining and snoolish coalescing um, enabled by default. If I'm not mistaken, I hope I'm not, because those features are just a game changer. Uh, Godsby or Next, uh, both, depending on a use case. I mean, both are great tools. Anyhow, continuing, the next thing we got here is announcement from the Deno team. Uh, Deno version 1.0 will be released on May 13th. So they've actually achieved all the major features that are necessary for 1.0 release. If you have a look at the ticket here with the tracking, all of the, almost all of them are ticked. There's like some uh, minor things left like the web server performance improvements and TypeScript and source maps are correctly recompiled and things like this. But you know, those are like minor things. So basically until May 13th, the team will be spending time uh, on polishing and correcting APIs which is uh, I think a pretty great timeline. So uh, Deno 1.0 will probably come out on May unless there is more delays, which as well, you know, might happen with the current pandemic situation. But hey, uh, let's see how that develops. It seems like it's shaping up quite nicely. So uh, I'm hoping, I'm, I'm wondering if they will be, uh, I'm, I'm guessing like basically we're not gonna see complete node compatibility until version two or whatever they decide to release it under because current node compat is shaky, let's just put it this way. But uh, yeah, it's, it's great to see this progress. So there we go. If you're curious, check out uh, the Deno repo. They release, uh, they basically publish releases, I think almost weekly, maybe sometimes even faster. So there was a new one recently with some uh, quite, quite a lot of changes really and new features added. So it is, they're making some nice progress. Um, speaking of Deno, I wanted probably at some point to do a live stream where we use Deno to build an electron-like app with just Deno and that WebView plugin that uses the native OS WebView for the UI, which I think might be a fun little experiment to see just how much you can do with it and how, um, you know, how much space do you actually, or how much RAM, I guess, do you actually take and how big the executable is in the end. But anyway, <laughs> let's just continue. Right, so the next thing we got here is today I learned about URL and data. Uh, apparently this is a function that allows you to send, to post the data to a server, even inside on before unloads where um, XHR or fetch isn't reliable and can be interrupted. And this thing apparently guarantees delivery of that event, which is uh, pretty cool. I didn't, I, like I never heard about send beacon thing and that this basically exists, but apparently that's that's a standard. So 
if you are doing things like this and you need to uh, reliably send analytics on page unloads, do check this one out. It seems to be quite helpful. Okay, next announcement we got here is from Rising Stack. They've officially adopted, I guess, a React Easy State library. So it's now React Easy State by Rising Stack. Uh, I think I already talked about React Easy State quite a few times. It's been around for quite a while. I even did a tutorial video on it. It's a really nice React State management library that uses ES6 and, or sorry, ES6 proxies. Um, it is built around essentially doing the classes. So sort of you have to use this view wrapper around your React components, which is a bit annoying. And you know, in the age of hooks, you could easily make a hook out of it. But uh, when there was a discussion there, in the issues, the author said that he basically is not a fan of hooks. So it's probably you're probably not going to see a hook here, you have to use this view wrapper. Um, I mean, you know, this is perfectly fine, uh, in my opinion, but I just prefer hooks. And it's a nice library if you um, want to use proxies, but it seems like there's a better like simpler solutions, let's just put it this way is that don't rely on proxies when you use hooks. But anyway, it's nice to see that it basically was adopted by rising stack and it's now going to be officially maintained, I guess, as a live and a healthy project, which is a cool news. Okay, continuing we got uh, so the team from Bloomberg behind the record and tuple proposal that are those immutable uh, things or immutable, what do you call it immutable data types for JavaScript is what you what you call it. Uh, they just put out the Babel transform and polyfill uh, for ECMAScript record and tuple proposal. So you can actually try them out in your code right now if you are using Babel, which is uh, pretty damn cool, right? So if you haven't seen the proposal, this essentially allows you to make records and tuples, which is immutable objects and immutable arrays that are, well, that work as immutable data. So if you construct two immutable records or tuples that are exactly the same, the comparison will return true, which is exactly what you would expect, which is uh, kind of great. So yeah, um, you can now use it in Babel. I think the proposal is still in stage one, I am really hoping it's gonna make it to like, stage two or three, at least this year, like at least stage two, that would be very nice. But it seems like it's moving at a very nice pace. So there we go. Okay, um, next thing we got here is the logical assignment proposal moves to stage three, which is uh, pretty nice to see. I honestly don't know if I would use something like this, but it's nice to have. So you know, instead of um, like, you can use the uh, logical operators with assignment, like you would the minus equals plus equals and so on and so forth, right? I don't know if I like the syntax. <laughs> To be honest, I guess it could be useful in some cases, but it's just I I personally don't remember any cases where I would need something like this. But I guess it's nice to have, right? So there we go. Uh, stage three means it's gonna land in most of the browsers in the next half a year or so, and it's probably gonna make it into uh, a ECMAScript 2021 because 2020 is almost finalized or I think it's already finalized maybe, but anyway. Continuing, we got uh, ergonomic brand checks for private fields, a private field in object, got to stage one uh, at TC39 that happened on April 2nd, there we go. So again, I haven't actually used private field yet, probably because I'm not really using uh, classes that much, but if you are, and if you wanted to uh, you know, be able to check if the object has the private property, well, this proposal makes it a lot easier. So you can just say private property in object and that will return true or false, which is a pretty nice, uh, I guess, thing to have instead of, you know, doing the whole try catch thing, which is annoying. Okay, um, the next thing we got here is the import.meta went to stage four, which means it's basically finalized and gonna be added to the uh, standard. I believe it is actually gonna be added to ECMAScript 2020 if I'm remembering this correctly. So there you go. And uh, now we got the feature set for ES 2020, which includes big int, dynamic import, nullish coalescing, optional chaining, promise all settled, string match all, global this, 
module namespace exports well defined for in order and import meta that I just covered basically. If you are interested, there is blog posts on uh, all of those features from the V8 team, which you can read uh, on, you know, specifics of them. Um, and most of them are actually already in Chrome, for example, and some of them are already in Firefox, which is uh, pretty great. So there you go, moving at a nice pace. All right, this is it for the tips, tricks, and bit-sized awesomeness. We got two releases this week. Uh, one of them is actually really interesting. So the first release here is uh, Theia. Uh, it is, um, it, it's called Eclipse Theia actually. So this is from Eclipse Foundation, right? So this is backed by Eclipse Foundation and it's um, an alternative to VS Code as they position it. But here's the thing. So VS Code is purely a desktop thing, right? So there was, of course, efforts to port it to the uh, web. Like for example, the Code Sandbox has their own version uh, that is essentially a fork of VS Code they maintain that supports the, um, that allows you to work in a browser essentially, right? So the Thea has a different goal. It's basically one of the goals is single source for browser and desktop. So you can use it both as a desktop thing and you can use it in your browser without actually doing any, you know, forking or doing anything. So it natively works in a browser, which is a really cool idea, I think. So I think it's definitely possible to do something like this for VS Code as well, but it just wasn't their goal. But it's interesting to see an IDE that has a goal to be a cloud and desktop at the same time. Now, if you look at the screenshots, it looks a lot like VS Code. Uh, interesting thing, thing is that I believe it's not a fork of VS Code, so it was built from scratch. But since they build it as a replacement for VS Code, they seem to have gone in a you know similar manner. Uh, now, the interesting thing is that it actually runs VS Code extensions. So it's compatible with VS Code extension protocol that they released at some point. And you can just take any VS Code extensions you want and use them within Thea, which is uh, pretty cool. So, right. And yeah, so obviously they have their own um, VS Code extension registry that is not just limited to the VS Code, it also includes the other plugins and so on and so forth, which they say it basically extends to uh, other forks of VS Code such as VS Codeium and stuff like this. And uh, there's already a bunch of people who use it, which is pretty cool. So this is like one of the most interesting aspects of it. So it's not just a thing that was built in a vacuum and then they came out and like, hey, we built this cloud and desktop IDE but it's actually already being used by really big guys like Typefox, Ericsson, Red Hat, IBM, and Google and SAP and a bunch of others, which is just crazy. Like it's just, just came out as one O and it's already being used at this, you know, companies this big. I guess, like, I mean, the, the fact that you can just run it on a cloud natively is what intrigues me the most and use VS Code extensions in it. That would be very interesting to see how that develops. Again, you know, the Eclipse Foundation is, I mean, they produce some nice software and then not so nice software on the other hand, but uh, it's an interesting project. And I would say definitely keep an eye on it if you are interested in cloud IDEs. Uh, again, the contributors and adopters list is just bonkers, even at this point when they just released it. And the fact that it's just compatible with uh, VS Code extensions, again, this is just crazy. Uh, I think it is actually open source. So if you want to, you can have a look at the source code. What is the license actually? The license is Eclipse public license. Okay. I have no idea what that means actually. Um, wait a second. Eclipse public license, uh, TLDR legal. So one of my favorite websites is TLDR legal does a really good job of explaining the licenses. I think it was version, no, this, yeah, I think it was version one. So you can commercially use, modify, distribute, sub-license, use patent claims, private use. You cannot use trademark or hold liable. You must include license, disclose source, include copyright. Okay, so it's sort of like GPL, it seems. Okay, um, I mean, fair enough. That's, that's still pretty good. So if you're interested, do check it out. It actually looks like a really cool project. I probably want to try and deploy that somewhere and see how that works because having my own, like one of the problems I have while working on Windows is that I have to fiddle, like, first of all, is like, you know, when I want a game, I have to go and manually kill the VSL uh, demon because it takes off the precious resources from my game, right? 
The other point is that I have to fiddle with stuff like Docker, which doesn't exactly work on Windows and VSL friction, like in a, in a frictionless way. If I will be able to just buy a server from someone like Hertzner, which is relatively cheap, and then throw this thing in, set up my development environment there and just develop in a browser, that would be freaking awesome. Like I, I would be up for trying that. Like, do what do you guys like? Okay, so if you are guys watching this, if you are in comments and chat, whatever, watching the VOD of this, let me know if you want to see a live stream of trying this out because I would be totally up for that. That actually sounds like a fun project. But there we go. So that's Thea10. Um, as I say, finally a good browser ID. If you are interested, do check it out. Okay. Last release of the week is Perflink version 2.0. So this is a pretty nice and fancy website for uh, quickly comparing the performance of different operations. Uh, the 2.0 version includes the uh, things like tests run in isolated web workers, top level of weight and ESM import support, save and fork to and from local storage, uh, titles to test cases and graphs and uh, cross browser supports and also the interesting bit is the author swapped uh, React for Preact, which is, uh, I mean, I guess it makes sense for the performance focused website. Let me just uh, permit the JavaScript here so that we can actually see that. And uh, yeah, it's, it's actually a very nice looking, very fancy graphs, very nice dark UI. So if you want to run some performance tests, do check it out. It's actually pretty cool. Okay, that is it for the releases. And uh, now we're coming to the libs and demos. Let me have a look at the chat real quick. Uh, I gave it a try long ago. Terminal was a bit laggy, but don't know how it works now. I don't even, I haven't even seen it before. That's the interesting thing. I thought I, you know, I try to keep up with the news and collect all, and I mean, I have the damn news podcast, right? <laughs> I never even heard about it before, which is um, what astounds me the most, I guess. <laughs> But it looks really interesting, so um, I will be up for trying it and seeing it if you know if it's laggy or not. If if there's if there's problems setting it up, we can just basically I could just buy a box at Hetzner and we can try to set it up and see if that works. I will be totally up for that. But anyway, uh, coming to the libs and demos, we have quite a bit here today. I mean, not all of them are new, but there are some really cool ones that I have not seen before. Let me just open all of that. And let's get started. So the first one we got here is Vuex ORM, the Vuex plugin to enable object relation mapping access to Vuex store. So you like ORMs and you wanted to do that with uh, Vue.js, do check it out. It actually looks pretty nice. So I looked through the um, getting started tutorial and it's, it's actually pretty cool. So essentially you can almost kind of run the SQL queries in here, <laughs> which is crazy, but Looks kind of handy. Um, GitHub is promoting it on trends for almost eight months. Really? Oh man, I should probably look at GitHub. I never use GitHub trends. Like, should I start doing that? Is it an explore thing? Is that the one? Because I never use that page at all. I think I start the topics at some points, but that's basically it. I never come here. Uh, trending, there we go. I probably should start using that. I mean, thank you for the pointer. I keep forgetting this exists, like literally. I. <laughs> okay, I will try to use that more. Thank you for the pointer. Anyway, continuing, we got a node BLE. So this is the Bluetooth low energy library written uh, with pure Node.js, no bindings and backed by Blue Z with uh, via Dbus. Uh, so if you are working with the Bluetooth low energy devices and wanted to do that from Node.js, it seems like a really nice library. So I, you know, I never had cases like this and I'm not really working with IoT devices too much, but uh, there you go. Uh, if you are, then check this one out, seems quite nice. That Explorer repository is thingy on the left. Uh, Explore repositories thingy on the left. Uh, this is my report. Oh, oh, this one. I've never seen it here. I mean, I do see this one, but uh, I've never seen this. Okay, anyway, I'm, I'm gonna try to use the GitHub Explorer more to find something, <laughs> to find more stuff, but I keep forgetting this exists, honestly. Anyway, continuing, we got Bundle Buddy, a tool to identify bundle duplication across splits. So uh, the cool thing is that this is not just a tool that allows you to identify uh, duplicates, but it also gives you a way to share 
the bundle stuff with other people like the bundle analytics so that they can figure out, you know, help you figure out what's going on. This was one of the newest feature added. So if you're working a lot with bundles and, uh, you know, filling with bundle duplication and stuff like this, do check it out. It actually seems really nice. Um, uh, may I inject my Lisan JS library to this week's stream? I believe I had it last week, although you know it was uh, didn't really stream. But we could we could we could have a look at it again. Let me just uh, let me just open it real quick, because it is a pretty nice library. Uh, it was over here. There we go. Yes, Lisan. It's an uh, instantialization library reimagined. It basically allows you to write your translations in either JSON or JavaScript. It's very tiny, just 1.7 kilobytes, and then you can basically integrate it with any framework you want because it just uses pure functions, which uh, seems very damn handy. So uh, there you go. Okay, uh, let me have a look at the chat. BLE in the browser plus BBC micro. What is BBC micro bits? Uh, I have never heard about that. Let me see, BBC micro bits. Micro bits. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, oh, that looks really cool. Uh, okay, so this is. The, oh man. Okay, yeah, that I can see how this combo could be very fun to use. Yeah. Okay, that could be really cool. That's true. And uh, the browsers already have the access to Bluetooth at least behind the flags, right? So that could be a very fun way to code that thing. That is pretty cool. Thanks for sharing. Uh, anyway, continuing, we got Preconstruct. So this is a new fancy tool that allows you to develop and build your code painlessly in monorepos. So sort of the monorepo managing thing that uh, kind of set up the monorepo for your uh, project and allows you to do, uh, well, anything from bundling to developing to publishing in just a simple uh, Preconstruct command. Uh, so if you're working with monorepos, do check it out. The docs are a bit scarce right now. So there's like not, there's some, you know, blank spots that are not exactly described in a best way possible. But the library itself is actually seems to be quite nicely designed. So if you are curious, definitely check this one out. It seems to be pretty cool. Again, you know, if you're not working with monorepos, this probably is not going to be too much of a use, although I believe it does work without monorepos as well, but uh, then there's not too much benefit to using it essentially. Right, next thing we got here is React Cool Portal, React hooks for portals, which render models, drop downs, tooltips, and so on and so forth directly to the body. Uh, if you ever try to do your own model or portal, you know how painful it could be if you, especially if you need to render it into the body itself and uh, having just a easy hook like this to do that is uh, pretty damn handy to be honest. So there you go. Next thing we got here is news or NAS. I'm not exactly sure how to correctly to read that. It's a library to implement micro frontends compatible with React.js and uh, maybe more frameworks coming in the future. So the seems like the micro frontends architecture is uh, still alive and kicking and people are trying to make it nicer and better. And uh, yeah, so this is uh, yet another one that tries to uh, do that sort of uh, implement that sort of thing. I honestly, you know, I've I've tried to fiddle with uh, micro frontends, and every time I try to figure out where would they help as opposed to like one large monolith, I fail to see the use case, right? So it always seems like it's more of a managing solution where you have like a lot of teams that work on a lot of different things. But so is the component splits, right? So you can, instead of micro frontends, you can just split those things into components. And at least I haven't seen the cases where that wouldn't be more or less the same, wouldn't produce the same outcome. But uh, maybe you like micro frontends more, so do check this one out. Seems quite interesting. So maybe this is the lib that will help you. Again, only works with React right now. All right. Continuing, we got spinners React, lightweight SVG and CSS spinners for React that look quite nice. So, you know, if you are looking for spinners, uh, they also allow you to customize them uh, right here immediately with colors and everything and you get the code here. So, um, yeah, they can be very slow, very fast and so on and so forth. Looks quite nice. So if you are looking for them, do check it out again, you know, SVG and CSS, and I believe they are tree shakeable. So 
should be pretty damn good. Okay, continue, we got Tether. This is a positioning engine to make overlays, tooltips, and dropdowns better. Another one of those things that are really annoying to do on your own when you want to attach something to another element like a tooltip or a sidebar or whatever. If you ever try to do that yourself, you know how bad it is, especially with, you know, the scrolls and positioning and window sizes. And this library makes it a lot easier. So if you are looking for something like this, do check it out. This seems to be a very nicely built. And uh, it's also like just JavaScript, so framework agnostic. You can use it with pretty much anything. And uh, it's also very easy to use, just a few lines of code. Okay, continuing, we got Piano Charts, a JavaScript library to visualize musical notes on a piano keyboards. Uh, so if you are working with music and you wanted to visualize anything on piano, then this is a really easy way to uh, do it. So, you know, I, I mean, not, not much else to say. Looks very nice, but uh, have a very limited use case. But uh, there we go. Right, next thing we got here is a use sound, a React hook for playing sound effects. Please don't use this. This is probably annoying as hell. <laughs> but in cases where you do need to play a sound, this actually seems like a very nice way to do that. You literally just use sound with a URL and then you get a play function that you can call to play that sound. Uh, pretty straightforward, so there you go. Okay, next thing we got is code jar, a micro code editor. So yeah, this is a very tiny and easily embeddable code editor that allows you to, well, pick different languages, pick different styles, and it's also very tiny and very easy to use. It's just like two kilobytes and then it works on just about everything, including uh, mobile devices, and there is like a ton of examples here. So uh, yeah, it even allows you to do customized uh, text coloring, which I <laughs> I don't know why you would need that, but there you go. So it looks pretty nice. So if you wanted a tiny uh, embeddable editor, do check this one out. Obviously note, not a code mirror that has a lot of plugins, but if you just want some simple editing, this probably is a good idea. Right, next thing we got here is a note, note, notif, notif. I'm not sure how to read that. Notif, I guess. Uh, it's a dead simple JavaScript library for toast notifications. It's three kilobytes. It allows you to do well anything you want. Seems very nice and supports different animations, different types, and so on and so forth. Uh, so if you wanted toast notifications, with integrations with React, Angular, and Vue. Do check this one out, seems to be quite nice. This one actually helped me. I mean, it, it seems very handy. I personally not a big fan of toast notifications, um, but yeah, you know, they can be useful in some cases. Right, next thing we got here is Flowify. Uh, this is an extension for Firefox that allows you to create a custom start page. Um, so again, probably this is not exactly something, I mean, again, maybe you would use that as your homepage, but I would suggest looking at that more as a learning experience because it does quite a lot of very tricky things that are not that easy to do typically. And, uh, yeah, it's just a nice learning project. What do you do? What do you use instead? Instead of the toast, uh, toast notifications, I prefer in-place notifications because the toast is like, you know, you do thing over here, you just like type something, you hit an enter button and then you see a toast in another place and you have to like move your eyes. And I tend to miss those half of the times, to be honest. So if, if you have to notify me, notify me in place where I did that. Like that's usually not that hard and uh, it's, just works better with me, at least, you know, sits better with me. So there you go. Anyway, continuing, we got another world JS. This is um, JavaScript port of another world DOS game. So yes, it is like, um, this is um, another world. So that old DOS game ported completely to JavaScript. Uh, and you can even pick different drawing palettes, you can pick different introductions. Um, why is it not? It worked last time, what's happening? Uh, what? <laughs> Wait a second, reset, there we go. I guess I just, did it save my state from the last time I ran? I guess it did. 
I probably screwed it up last time. And yeah, there we go. There's actually low. So yeah, it's like you can you can play like yeah. Here's the retro mode for you. So like 320 by 200 pixels, perfect resolution to render that. And it's uh, open source, so you can actually have a look at the source code and how it was built on GitHub, which is uh, also pretty cool. So there you go. Okay. Uh, next thing we got here is HTML DOM.dev, a collection of uh, snippets that show you how to manage HTML DOM with vanilla JavaScript only. It's a really nice collection and shows you how to do some of those tricky things, um, you know, like removing elements, uh, I don't know, exporting a table to CSV and uh, there's like a bunch of them basically. So if you are just starting with JavaScript and wanted to learn uh, DOM manipulation in, um, I guess in a staged way because they do tag those as a basic, intermediate and advanced. It's a really nice collection that you can go through and learn quite a few things. Okay, I've opened it twice for some reason. Right, next thing we got here is sketchviz.com. This is, um, I mean, it's not exactly a library or demo or tool, but I found it to be pretty cool. So essentially it's um, a tool that allows you to create charts and visualizations using um, code, right? So this is sort of a meta, I guess the DSL for graphs that you can then build here using the same library that the uh, Excalidraw uses, I forgot the name of it. And then you can basically export it either as embed or download PNG or save to GitHub. And then obviously you can toggle sketchy or non-sketchy view and I, what was the... Scully draw. So there's the Scully draw, and there is the library they use for rendering all of that stuff. Is what was the name of it? Oh god, the hand drawn thing. God, I used it more than one time myself, and I completely forgot. What was the name of it? Uh, Dev dependencies. RoughJS. There we go. That's what it's called. Right, RoughJS. It's a very nice visualization library that allows you to do things like this and. Not just this, also allows you know normal styles and things. So yeah, there you go. Anyway, if you ever wanted to code your uh, things, then do check it out. Yes, Dexter, thank you uh, for. <laughs> I was I I'm really bad at remembering names of stuff I use. <laughs> anyway, the last thing we got here for today is colors. Uh, this is uh, overly descriptive color palettes. Like the color palettes themselves are actually really nice and it seems like they're, you know, they've been uh, very nicely composed, but that's not the important part. The important part here is the names of the colors in those palettes. So we got uh, um, ectophytic light gray blue, whatever the hell that means. Foo yellowish orange, uh, tractive Barbie P I how do I don't know if that's like, if that's correct. I don't even know if that's true, but I just, I, I spent, I think like half an hour reading those names because it's just so silly. Come on, Dr. Go, what is happening with my internet? There we go. Is that, is that even a word? It doesn't seem like it's, it's a real world. <laughs> uh, maybe Google knows that. Uh, yeah, okay, so this is literally from the colors LOL, but, uh, and there's a, Twitter, yeah, okay, you know what? I'm not gonna say if that's true or not, so just figure out it yourself if you want to, but those names are bonkers. That's just, that's all I wanna say. Okay, that's it for Libs and Demos. Now we got some interesting stuff to close this off. The first one is the announcement from Internet Archive. So they just made 1.4 million copyrighted books available for free online. So if you wanted to read some books while you're on quarantine, uh, you can now access a ton of them from Internet Archive and uh, just grab them and read them. At least for now, uh, which is um, pretty cool. I mean, I, so it's like, it says that they're venturing in uncharted legal waters, which I'm assuming is not exactly has to deal with the uh, pandemic thing, but they're trying to just make them publicly available, which is, um, an interesting move. But anyway, if you want your books, then do check this out. It seems like a really cool uh, place to do that. Right. Uh, next thing we got here is the announcement from Pluralsight. Uh, they are making uh, all of their courses available for free for entire month of April. Uh, they say no catches and no credit card required. There is one catch. If you already have an account, uh, you're not going to get them. You have to create a new one 
uh, right now in April, and then you're gonna get it for like a month, I guess. So if you ever wanted to check out any courses on Pluralsight, but were, you know, figuring out if you wanna pay or not, well, then you can just uh, do it for free. They do have mostly uh, tech related stuff in there. So uh, there's like JavaScript, Angular, Python, C Sharp. Uh, there's some, uh, what is there? There was like Linux courses. Uh, there's some R courses security stuff and things. So it, it looks like a really nice collection of stuff. So if you are curious to check it out, the JavaScript seems to be on um, first place out of everything basically, which is uh, kind of cool. So there you go. Okay, next announcement we got here is the, uh, it's a nice collection of projects, open source projects, uh, open source healthcare projects that you can contribute to uh, to help combat COVID-19. So if you are sitting at home and you don't know what to do and you want to code more, you want to, to contribute to open source projects, then there is a very nice collection here. And there's basically everything starting from the uh, relatively straightforward websites and you know data analysis, going to the project open air and open source ventilators and things like this. So if you're curious, do check it out uh, in, you know, and figure out if you want to jump in and help with this stuff because it's always kind of awesome. Okay, last thing we're here for today is introducing 1111 for families. So if you never heard about 1111, this is a project from Cloudflare. So this is their uh, secure, fast and privacy first DNS resolvers that is free for anyone. So as the part of their uh, business, they essentially run a DNS resolver that is aims to be the fastest and uh, privacy first because they don't store any logs, I think longer for than like 12 hours or something. I'm not sure if they, maybe they even changed that for even less and they do like public audits, uh, which they did a few weeks ago. So you can actually see how exactly it works. And now they are introducing the uh, 111 for families. So what that means is um, you actually got two more DNS resolvers right now. You got 1112, which blocks malware and 1113, which also blocks adult content, which I guess is can be handy when you have like small kids uh, and don't want them to uh, go on a porn websites or anything. But uh, yeah, it's like it's a, a bit dubious thing, but uh, malware blocking thing is definitely a good. Um, good thing so if you have you know grandparents parents whoever is not very proficient with uh, technology and they use internet i would basically use this as their primary dns on the router and then install them something like brave which requires zero configuration and blocks like ads and pop-up garbage to make it a lot safer for them on the web so um I, I mean, I've been using 111 almost since the first day as my primary DNS and it's been working great. Like it's a lot faster than even my ISP's DNS, which is kind of great. It also uses DNS over TLS and DNS over HTTPS, which means that, you know, everything is encrypted. So your ISP doesn't really know what the hell are you uh, resolving, which is um, kind of great. So there we go. All right, um, that is actually it for the episode 108. If you guys have any questions, suggestions, uh, or anything else, throw it into the chat. If not, then we can wrap it up here for today and uh, go have, um, I don't know, play video. I still haven't finished Half-Life Alex, which is awesome, by the way. Go brave and pie hole. I mean, if you have a pie hole, you don't really need brave anymore, but uh, pie hole requires some technical knowledge and maintenance, right? And this thing doesn't, and it's a lot easier, but uh, I totally get that. I mean, pie hole is a pretty nice project. Okay, uh, again, feel free to throw in uh, questions and uh, blah, blah, blah. Okay, let me see. What will be the next building X with um So next dev stream will be about building this chat we have here ourselves because this one is not working too well with the YouTube. And the plan is to build our own chat that would grab the YouTube, Twitch and Mixer now and uh, see if it will actually work better than the restream chat. I am not sure about that, but we're going to try it uh, because a lot of you guys uh, wanted to see me build that. And a lot of you guys complained that the YouTube chat is not appearing fast enough here. So we're going to try and see if we can actually fix that. 
Okay, uh, again, throw your questions or suggestions in the chat. Meanwhile, as usual, you can find all the links on GitHub or on bxjs.dev. We have as well the Discord server where you can join and talk to us about JavaScript or video games. Uh, you can also follow me on iTunes or Anchor Fam or Player Fam if you want to listen to this in audio form. There's also a Telegram channel where I collect unfiltered links. And uh, that's basically it. Oh yeah, you can follow me on Twitter for uh, JavaScript news, video games and other shit posting that I usually do. Uh, BLE is available on Chrome without flags. Really? Wait a second, Chrome BLE. Is it really available without flags already? When did I miss that point? Before we get started, blah, 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 HTTPS only, button, pointer, navigator, Bluetooth request device. Okay, let me just, let me just open a new window over here. This is super tiny. Um, I am curious now. I, I was under impression that this is still an unstable spec, so it's not really available anywhere. Okay, interesting. It is available without flags. All right. Um, navigator Bluetooth. I want, is it just the... Does the Firefox also has that? Am I, am I just really lagging behind the... Okay, so the Firefox doesn't have it, so I guess it's not standardized yet. Uh, which means, okay, so it's a Chrome-only API for now. But it's interesting that it's not, not even behind the flags or anything like that. That's pretty, okay. I, that, that's great to know. I probably should experiment that. Uh, blah, blah, Chrome, se okay, Chrome 70 was when, when it was enabled. So it's relatively recent-ish, I guess. <laughs> Neat, cool, thanks for heads up. Hey, Lucas, welcome to the stream, or I guess the end of the stream because we're almost wrapping up. <laughs> Um, YouTube is like 15 seconds delay. Yeah, the chat, I mean, it's not consistent. That's the problem with the chat. Sometimes it shows it immediately and the other times it's like 10, 15, 20 seconds delayed, which is just, I mean, it's really annoying. So we are gonna try to build a better chat. Okay, um, right. Any more questions, suggestions or things you wanna discuss this week? If not, then let's just wrap it up here. And if you wanna talk about anything, just uh, drop into the Discord server and let's chat there. I will uh, give you a couple of minutes. Meanwhile, um, yeah, I guess I just, you know, want to stay, want to say, stay safe, uh, stay at home, wash your hands and uh, don't get sick. Uh, These times are, it's still just insane. Uh, where is the Discord? It should be on bxjs.dev or in, I think it should be on a Twitch channel description as well. And it should be in a YouTube video description and whatever. It's like, it should be everywhere basically. <laughs> so there you go. Okay, um, right, I think that basically covers it. Okay, uh, any more questions, suggestions, or anything else you guys wanna discuss? Maybe I missed some libraries, maybe you wanna share your own. If not, then let's just wrap it up here. I'll give you 20 seconds, you got 20 seconds. And if not, I'm, you know what? I, <laughs> this is the stupidest thing ever. So um, I started playing Animal Crossing and this game is just insane. Like you, you literally cannot play more than an hour or two a day because it just caps you, but it's the chillest game ever. And for some reason, I, I never liked game like this, but for some reason I just cannot stop <laughs> to grow my farm. <laughs> God damn it. Okay, doesn't seem like we have any more questions or suggestions. So let's just uh, wrap it up here at this point. So um, as usual, thank you guys very much for watching. Hope you have an awesome rest of the weekend or if you're watching a video of this, rest of the week. Um, yeah, again, stay safe, stay at home, wash your hands and I see you on Wednesday for the chat development live stream.